thank you so much for coming. Um, I am Courtney Finn. I'm the curator here at the Aspen Art Museum. And I'm very excited to introduce tonight's Another Look lecture with Dr. Claire Lyons, who's the curator of antiquities at the Getty in LA. Um, she is going to give us a presentation, a kind of an, another look related to our show by Berlin-based Cypriot artist Harris Empanonda, which is on view in Gallery 4 and 5. So we'll do sort of presentation, kind of a conversation, and then everyone is invited to go down to the gallery and kind of have another view of the show after having heard Claire talk. Um, I should say... Claire is an exceptional scholar, so we're very pleased to have her. She received her AB in Classics from Bowdoin College and her MA and PhD in Classical Archaeology from Bryn Mawr. She has written extensively on Greek art and archaeology, taking a special interest in antiquities and social contexts, both ancient and modern. Um, she has curated and contributed to numerous publications, but um, one show in particular that I wanted to mention was that in 2006, she co-curated the exhibition Antiquity and, Antiquity and Photography, Early Views of Ancient Mediterranean Sites, which was part of the inaugural um, changing exhibition space at the Getty v Villa. So um, we're very thrilled to have her. I should also say um, this presentation and the Another Look Lecture series is part of our Questrom Lecture series and made possible by the Questrom Education Fund. So thank you so much. Enjoy. <laughs> if I speak in this tone of voice, I think it's good for this small room. I um, let me know because we're recording there. But I do want to thank uh, Heidi Zuckerman and Michelle December for their invitation. They're welcome. My first visit to Aspen, and especially Courtney Finn and Haris Epamananda for organizing really a very, a, a wonderful and very thought-provoking exhibition. In an institution for contemporary art, um, I'm really pleased to have the opportunity to talk about antiquity. It's my favorite subject, um, and it's actually not entirely a disconnect. Recently, a surprising number of artists have taken what has been called the archaeological turn. And I want to check that, in fact, the slides need to come on. Yeah. <laughs> I have pictures for you. The archaeological turn. This, in fact, has practically always been the case. Right up through the 19th century, antiquity has been a touchstone. And it resurfaces wherever imagery, wherever conventions of the past continue to exert a pull on contemporary sculpture. My computer can't oh, no. <laughs> Good. Good. The trend has become fashionable in certain archaeological museums and on sites at Pompeii. Monument monumentalized fragments were implanted to capture, to captivate visitors by evoking that era of exploring antique lands. In Venice at Palazzo Grassi, the theme of rediscovery is now on view in an appropriately named exhibition treasures from the wreck of the unbelievable, which conjures up a cinematic trove of seaweed-covered Roman, Egyptian, and Aztec statues rescued from undersea. A renowned Greek sculpture of an animal combat, the lion attacking a horse, is a paradigm for a work currently on display in Rome. Mountain lion attacking a dog transposes this icon of the classical canon into a vernacular image from the Western American wilderness. Others approach the act of recovering the past with the archaeologists exacting attention to detail, as in this panoramic light box transparency of field excavation in progress. This site-specific installation engaged in a kind of reverse archaeology. The artist arranged discarded floor tiles in a pyramid inside of a decaying automobile plant in the post-industrial ruins of Detroit. There is something compelling about the way figural and minimalist works play off of each other, whether in terms of the symmetry between the archaic and the abstract, or the asymmetries 
of pictorial works in stark modern spaces. There are countless examples of these interconnections between antiquity and modernity. And in fact, I just realized this morning, opening up my newsfeed, a new exhibition on the dialogue between Cy Twombly and ancient art just opened today in Athens. Um, I didn't have time to get the slide of it. Um, however, the work of Haris Epaminanda stands apart from most of her contemporaries. Her archaeological turn is apparent in a choice of artifacts and their very, very studied placement. Beginning in 2009, ongoing installations of volumes have been presented in numbered editions up through number volume 22, which is now uh, downstairs on display. They assemble an array of vases, polished stone, gold foil, elements from the natural world, and small figurines from different cultures. Broken paving stones or a small dune of swept sand seem to allude to subterranean remains. Her enigmatic constellations of artifacts tempt us to connect the dots, but it's not easy. Two installations in London and Paris juxtaposed symbols from antiquity that also occur in volume 22, pottery, columns, and the detached head of a sculpture. <coughs> in art history, the broken column often signifies loss and the frailty of human effort. The sure contours of a Greek vase or a carved profile appeal to the romantic Hellenists at the turn of the 18th and 19th centuries, and they still do. The notion that fragments speak more eloquently than complete works is a Renaissance invention, and we now take it for granted that less can be more. Among the antiquities that Michelangelo most admired was a powerfully built seated male known as the Belvedere torso, which is only partly preserved. An Egyptian queen's damaged face is all the more alluring for what we don't see but try to imagine. In volume 19, what drew my attention are the particular associations between the fragments. The head belongs to a kuros, which is the earliest life-size naturalistic representation of the beautiful male body in Greek art. On the ground, a column capital depicting a tree of life belongs to another key moment in monumental building. These forms appear in the Greek world around the same time. And if you want to keep delving into them, on Cyprus, both were used as grave markers and votive dedications. So we have two parallel objects that stand at the inception of classical sculpture and architecture. Both of them celebrate life and death. Now, this is, a, uh, I will confess, this is an admittedly academic and didactic reading, and it references the artist's Mediterranean background. But mainly, it's sparked by the formality of the arrangement. A curatorial eye is evident in the pleasing contrast between the geometric outlines, the pair of spiraling volutes, and the beaded pattern that you see on the Kouros's hair. Below, a rough piece of stone hangs over its base, off-centered, slightly disrupting the balance. Plinths, freestanding walls, and frames articulate the objects within a defined architectural boundary. The effect of these objects, and the ones that um, I hope you've seen it already, but we will see afterward downstairs, is that of a museum without walls, ever expanding as chosen objects are inducted into the collection. Sometimes the artist mingles classical references with imagery from Chinese art, the ancient landscapes of her native Cyprus, and the tranquil aura of Buddhist sculpture are influences that she acknowledges. One grouping recreates the serene ambience of a Japanese tea ceremony in which each simple element denotes an unseen and very intricate <laughs> social ritual. Although the setting is modern, it is reminiscent of the scatter of artifacts on an ancient site. In her video work, Chronicles, which was shown at MoMA, stills of ancient art are cropped from old textbooks and museum guides. Collage echoes an archaeological exercise in exposing remains, doing archival research, and then selecting and presenting the finds. For me, 
these installations raise some interesting issues about the context of art and how display affects interpretation. Organizing artifacts in a fine art gallery has consequences, one being that it highlights them as singular aesthetic objects to be admired in vitrine under controlled circumstances. This forces a question. Do Epaminondas open-ended installations suggest that museums decontextualize objects and that the stories they tell are more about our story than their own? Is that a problem? Or has it always been about our story? So tonight, um, Heidi and, and um, all the colleagues here asked me to come at this subject from uh, quite a different trajectory. So I've been asked to consider the kind of archeological imaginary that Haris Epaminanda recreates through ready-mades, through found objects. And so I'd like to actually now switch to the world that I inhabit, which is the world of ancient art in context and on display. Now, notwithstanding the um, illustrations that I showed at the beginning of this talk, you might think, and you'd be forgiven for thinking that antiquity and contemporary art are at polar opposites of a spectrum. But in fact, they share a couple of concerns. Found objects, fragments, and ruins, site specificity, collage, and superimposition. When you delve in more deeply into the history of something, often what we're appropriating is the idea of excavating, as when archaeology is used as a metaphor for psychoanalytical processes of forgetting and remembering. So we might start by considering con context in the plural, in terms of place, form, and imagery. For the archaeologist, context is place. And a thing that is in situ is something that is in its original undisturbed location. Antiquities come down to us as fragile survivors from periods which are either silent or which are ignored in the written record. To bridge that gulf of time that separates then from now, it's really essential to know the place and the circumstances in which artifacts are found. Human lives leave traces and they can be recovered systematically by means of a grid laid over the site which fixes the find in three-dimensional space. Each sector is explored by dismantling layer by layer, starting from the earliest, the, uh, starting from the most recent on top, and working your way down to the earliest at the bottom. So what we mean, what archaeologists mean by an object in situ are its coordinates within the stratigraphy and its association with other features, with architecture, and with the artifacts that are around it. Deposits can be deliberate accumulations or random dispersals, depending on the circumstances, destruction, abandonment, or burial. Most archaeologists tend to think of context as the true reality of an, of an artifact, but I think it's probably more accurate to consider it as the final ancient setting, the last of several previous realities in which an object was meaningful. So to illustrate this, I'm going to share a little bit of a biographical anecdote of my own. This is a site that I worked on some years ago in southern Italy. It's a site where we were uh, quite interested in exploring the countryside around the ancient Greek city of Metaponto. And we were very interested in how the residents made use of the territory. So our task that summer was to uncover ancient farmhouses and with workmen from nearby villages, we excavated four sites that gave a, big, a very good snapshot over a number of centuries. The structures belong to mod very modest farmers. Simple houses didn't really give you a hint of the truly abundant riches in harvests of barley, which are then came to be figured on the city's silver coins. Erosion had reduced the buildings to just a few courses of stone and a scatter of terracotta roof tiles. The objects that remained were only those that had been left behind. But by mapping the finds within these pretty unpromising uh, ruins, the outline of the house's ground plan emerged. And from that, a convincing elevation can arise, furnished with utilitarian household goods from the lifeways of a family. 
we pondered why several quite fine vases were abruptly discarded, some of them nearly intact and functional. Inside a central room was something more out of the ordinary, a terracotta plaque bearing the image of a richly draped woman holding a blossom in front of her breasts and a smaller female figure carrying a lamb over her shoulders, probably a goddess and a worshiper bringing an animal to sacrifice. There is nothing quite like this plaque from anywhere in the region. To us, it, has a, it brings a very familiar bell. It's the image of the good shepherd and a maternal divinity. The presence of what in later periods would have been considered a votive icon conveyed an unexpectedly in intimate picture of the values and beliefs of the individuals who lived there. And it brought the other vessels found around it into focus as things that were used in domestic religion, centered near the hearth. Why it was left behind, face down in the dirt, um, is a mystery. It raises maybe a, some disturbing um, possibilities. But the image brings us a step closer to the people who lived there, and that, in fact, is the basic goal of the archaeological enterprise. So writing history from tangible artifacts involves seeing them as parts of a collective. But it also involves seeing them as individual things in and of themselves. The qualities of their material, their shape and design can identify sources, techniques, and sometimes even the hand of anonymous artists. Function and decoration give insights into the kind of individuals who own them. As tastes change, forms change. Pottery and statuettes are sensitive registers of style. Style evolves and can be applauded over time. One of the really useful little tools um, among many that archaeologists turn to is the perfume flask. It was made in ancient Corinth on the Greek mainland. It starts off as a diminutive rounded container for scented oils, and it becomes more pointed. Connecting changes in the shape and style to known dates provides us with a framework. At Selinunte, which is uh, excavation just of about two years ago that you see here, one of the most important and imposing architectural sites in the classical world, these little perfume flasks were found on the floor of the settlement's first temple, which was erected not long after the site was founded in 628 BC. So the intersection of the rel relative date that we can deduce from the artifacts type and the absolute chronology of a historical event can then be extended to other sites. When that context is lost, the link to this matrix is broken, and we have to put more weight on the material and visual qualities, yet nevertheless something truly essential is missing. So in addition to physical environment and the formal stylistic qualities of objects, a third interpretive context is imagery. Illustrations add a further level of complexity because motifs are an inherited visual grammar and the meanings of them depend on who's looking. When seen in the light of many related depictions of a story or a motif, these pictorial codes can reveal a culture's underlying concepts and beliefs which are otherwise not access accessible. Currently on display in our gallery, for example, is this oversized jar made for storing wine Painted on it are three men who are driving a stake into the eye of a seated figure, and we recognize him as Polyphemus, the one-eyed cyclops from Homer's Odyssey. In the myth, Odysseus and his men encountered po Polyphemus. Uh, he was a monstrous shepherd who tended his flocks. They captured, he captured the crew and proceeds to devour them. But Odysseus is clever. He offers the cyclops wine. He becomes inebriated and falls asleep. And that gives the Greek sailors the chance to blind him and sneak out of the cave by tying themselves underneath the bellies of his sheep. Now in this gallery, the, uh, this, this uh, very large jar, it's called a pithos, is placed among Greek and Roman objects which illustrate Homer's epics. But it's actually Etruscan. It's associated with the site of Cervetri, which is uh, a little bit north of Rome. And it's a place where immigrant artists worked and where exotic goods were imported through a very lively Mediterranean commerce. 
this really changes things because far, far more than just a wine container, the jar is a vehicle for the spread of lifestyles, art, and poetry. In front of Polyphemus sits a jar. It's exactly the type that was introduced by these overseas merchants. Stories like this, stories of dangerous encounters with savage foreigners are visual metaphors for colonialism and they mirror the social reality of trade and conflict that shaped those two cultures. Each aspect of this really extraordinary object is a window into a much larger world. Now, so far, the, my comments have lingered on these several different kinds of contexts which antiquities inhabit, and they can be pieces of a specific site, a singular work of art, or a microcosm of a much larger cultural environment. This implies that their biographies, if we can call it that, consist of richly textured lives. The life of art can be imagined as an itinerary. And here I try to chart it out. Um, it may be a little hard to read, I think you can. Starting from the gathering of raw stone, metal, and clay, to the technologies of artistic creation, the object's uses, its abandonment or deposit, and finally its recovery and its multiple uh, afterlives in collections and museums. So if you visualize the biography as a journey from place to place, it foregrounds the people who use, shape, and interpret works of art and artifacts. We make objects. But by the same token, objects demand certain ways of being, of moving, of doing. Our social identities are defined by the things that we surround ourselves with. Objects make us. So how do we capture these multiple lives, this web of meanings in which objects are completely enmeshed within the confines of a vitrine and labels? I think this is a good moment to pivot and think about the question of display, which is such a dominant part of the um, curated installation that Haris has put together here. Display and interpretation are two sides of a coin. Traditionally, installations have either been grounded on art historical uh, premises or archaeological criteria. And we can look at just a few of the very many precedents and current approaches that have guided how we see them and how that might in turn reflect uh, how we uh, interpret um, ancient works of art. Renaissance aristocrats furnish their residences with crowded accumulations of statues. And they were there as primarily aesthetic objects that asserted the prestige of a noble, noble family's ancient roots. The idea that history could be written with things as well as words redefined artifacts as evidence. Collections were ordered by type and specimens were displayed as if in a laboratory or a scholar's study. Most modern museums pursue a kind of middle road between those two strands and history and aesthetics are woven together the influence of contemporary design is more and more per pervasive. A contextual approach that synthesizes culture across place and time is most successful when it's closely connected to an actual site. In 2010, the new museum designed by the Swiss architect Bernard Chumi opened in Athens, and it was uh, built to house many of the finds from around the Acropolis that looms over it. The plan is on three floors, and the first thing that visitors see as they enter are late Roman and Byzantine foundations exposed below the ground level. The galleries above present the evidence for human presence on the Acropolis and surroundings in a display that's dominated by quintessential white marble sculptures interspersed among structural columns. Chumi's design refers both to temple colonnades, which are found throughout Athens, but also to the dense array of statues that were once set up in, throughout the city as dedications and grave markers. On the top level, which gives a 360 degree view over the modern city, the Parthenon sculptures are mounted in direct visual alignment with the great temple on the Acropolis. Short of physically reattaching them to the facade, which of course is not an option, 
the sculptures are as close to in situ as possible, yet paradoxically they are still severed from the original 5th century building. Gaps in the installation mark the positions in, uh, where the matching marbles, still in the British Museum, uh, are absent. And it positions the museum right in the midst of the present day politics of cultural heritage. It's a wonderfully effective synthesis of lives of objects from past to present. In their homelands, ancient art installations usually reflect a pretty strictly historical agenda, but not always. That's because most of the people who run museums are archaeologists, <laughs> but not always. Uh, one of my favorite museums is the Capitoline, which is the oldest public museum of any kind and houses one of the truly great collections of classical art. A branch gallery was opened in the converted Monte Martini thermoelectric plant. Greek and Roman marbles are set among machine age technologies of power. Classical art confronts urban industrial archeology span and the effect is truly stunning. And in a theoretical sense, it's also um, extremely contextual, these two different moments of the urban history of Rome brought together in this space. If you haven't been, I highly recommend it. It's a little bit outside. Um, take public transportation, but you will love it and nobody goes there. You'll have it all to yourself. It's wonderful. <coughs> two years ago in Venice, the exhibition Portable Antiquity explored the life of antique sculptures as small-scale copies, showing them not as masterpieces, but as serial reproductions. Inside the Baroque venue of the Prada Foundation, a daring installation centered on a vertical row of vitrines with the Heracles Farnese shown in diminishing proportions. This strategy was intended to undermine the proposition that classicism involves timeless, unique, and original works of artistic creation. Here we are. At the Getty Villa, the display of works of art is something that we've been thinking about a great deal. Earlier this year, we started off on a project to completely reinstall 30 galleries containing about 1,400 objects. The villa bears little resemblance to the museums that we've just been seeing. It imitates an ancient Roman villa that was partially excavated in, Pom in Herculaneum near Pompeii. And for the last 10 years, the arrangement of the objects has been a thematic ones with galleries d dedicated to topics such as gods, ancient theater, heroes, and that sort of thing. So the approach was centered on imagery, on iconography. To a lesser extent, it engaged cultural or typological clusters of objects, but not at all uh, on archeological context, despite the historicizing architecture. The scheme had certain advantages. It has the advantage of featuring collection strengths and conveying basic information about the ancient world in an accessible way. But one limitation, however, is that the scheme blurred the differences between objects made over the span of several thousand years. Well, to address that, the decision was taken to reinstall the collection chronologically, in date order from the earliest works in the Bronze Age right down through the classical Hellenistic and the Roman period. So 1,400 objects um, were thrown up in the air and they're landing in an entirely uh, new scheme. This is a rendering of how one of the Roman galleries is going to look in about a year. How art and the cultures that produced it changed over time and influenced one another is the underlying narrative. Other approaches I've been describing can be experimented with, and that's probably better done in the space of our changing exhibition galleries where you can really take a deep dive into ancient art and think a lot about the afterlives of antiquity, the materiality of objects, the cultural exchanges that took place across the Mediterranean between the Near East and the Greco-Roman world, all kinds of very specific questions that you can bring the loans in, juxtapose them, and try to tell a very, very different narrative. But for the permanent galleries, um, we're gonna have a very consistent way of seeing how art changes over time slowly and seeing, uh, getting a better sense of the shape of the classical Mediterranean. As these installations show, 
display can reinforce a great variety of narratives. To some people in our field, museumization, if that's a word, museumization is open to the critique that it diminishes the historical context in which artifacts functioned. Their direct connections to ancient people are filtered through modern academic and aesthetic criteria. Objects of daily life were never intended to be art, capital A, they say. And when they're reframed in cases and on pedestals, their original meanings are distorted. And in certain respects, of course, I, th there's a certain amount of truth to that. But what I would say in response is that museums are among the best places for exploring the long and winding itineraries in the lives of art and artifacts and for bridging that gap between then and now, between them and us by looking, uh, by enjoying, and by thinking about uh, what is there. The in the installations of Haris Epamananda, the archaeological turn produces, I think, a really thoughtful setting for applying exactly these perspectives. She's created a kind of imaginary universal museum within a museum. Her work, as they say, is good to think with. And that's what I hope we can do now in conversation and then downstairs in the gallery. So thank you for coming. I'd be happy to answer or uh, any questions or elucidate some of these. This is a, a dense and quick survey of the uh, history of ancient art display and context. Thanks again. <laughs>
so that you really can start to follow some of these objects back in history. It's not, they're not lost. Um, and we've really, a couple times, we've been able to get them right back to the place in the ground, or at least back several centuries. So they're working on it all the time. And it's become a movement. A lot of museums are also pursuing this to try to knit these stories back together. So I think it's extremely worthwhile. Um, and you know, as I said, absolutely, absolutely fascinating. Yeah. Other thoughts? So I was just thinking that like a lot of these artifacts you look at reflect kind of an affluent or material thing, but you know, that vase is so beautiful and you know, they reflect a kind of a, a accumulation of assets and money. And and, yeah. and I think kind of contemporary art or art also has that relationship and even the kind of illegal purchasing of artifacts. I was thinking What's your favorite object that you have kind of discovered or known about that wasn't about that, but had a kind of story around it that taught you so much about where it came from? Yeah. Does that make any sense? Yeah, you know, it makes perfect sense. I showed the one with a story on it of, um, of uh, Odysseus and Polyphemus. It is, you know, one of my favorites, but you're right, this is very much an elite object. You have to imagine that it's, you know, it's about this tall, it's filled with wine. So the people, the aristocrats and the Etruscan elite that are sitting around, you know, enjoying it, drinking uh, in the Greek mode, telling Greek stories. And you have to imagine how they're seeing themselves in relationship to this other culture, which in fact has uh, gone and humiliated one of their um, southern Italian, you know, uh, neighbors. So how they position their own identity in relationship to those two cultures is really interesting, and you can read this all over this big vase, but most objects are similar to the ones I showed from the excavation in southern Italy, where they are pretty modest. Um, and they are especially modest when you are there on site, you know, you're finding them and you're looking at this on this microscopic level of shirt by shirt. Um, and it's not until later that the whole you know, puzzle, to use a cliche, the whole crossword puzzle starts to come together. In fact, you know, I love that uh, plaque. Um, that I showed because it really, you know, was such an interesting piece and there was nothing like it. It just came out of the blue. What happened? Why would you ever leave? You wouldn't leave that behind. So something happened there. Um, but the interesting experience I had, and which is another reason I showed it, is that that was in, I shouldn't say, that was in 1980. Um, and we, a lot of work was done at that site. It's very important over the years. But it was only a just a very few, two or three years ago, that the site was published by young Italian students. The book that they came out with is about this thick, um, hundreds of pages, where all of these finds really came together in a narrative. Um, and, you know, they reconstituted the whole uh, assembly, that, which for me was just very um, highly focused on the minute level. So it's a very interesting um, experience to see that all come together after, many years afterwards. So, and yeah, there are other things. I'd worked in, um, in the Etruscan area near Siena for a number of years, as well as in Greece, as well as in Sicily. So, you know, I sometimes see the objects and I remember that, you know, one was mine. <laughs> <laughs> More than one, but. And you have books that you've, I'm sorry, I'm, a, I'm technically at work. <laughs> <laughs> Don't <laughs> say. <laughs> Okay, next, she's going to come back. <laughs> oh, it's a phone, I see. Um, some other comments. These are some of the ideas that I think that inform, um, you know, the work that we're going to go back downstairs and see. These are some of the ideas of what I'm not trying to explain, and I gave, as I said, a highly academic, highly curatorial reading of these objects as if there were labels that could have been written right by those um, archaic Greek fragments. But in fact, as you saw downstairs, there aren't labels, they are in enigmatic, and there are things that seem to be disconnected. Why are there imagery of classical antiquities juxtaposed with things, obviously, from a Chinese or a Korean context? Why there are no labels, but when there are wall texts, they don't seem to relate. Is that a kind of critique of our whole museum enterprise? We have to pick an explanation. Maybe we can pick two if each one is two sentences. You know, there's a whole world beyond that, and how we get to that um, is something that, you know, I think that does take a certain amount of imagination and looking. So I don't want to interpret her work for you, but I think it really repays um, the looking. What would you do? How would you 
think of these things? How do you think of the things that are around you? Um, what does it mean? How, what would you gather together? Um, very interesting, very interesting. Do you want to try it? No, I'm, I'm just so excited to get listen to you today. <laughs> oh, thanks. Do you have books that I can find on your biography that you've written? Yeah, there are a, a number of different exhibition catalogs. Oh, specifically about yes. Yes. Yeah. In fact, you know, in my own, in my alternative life, I am a, an archaeologist, and my subject was cemeteries and death. So, <laughs> I published. Uh, <laughs> I published, you know, a, a, a necropolis in Sicily, um, very interesting place where Greek people were intermingling with native Italic peoples and what happened to the culture, which is maybe you saw the theme as I showed Sicily, <laughs> and that uh, it's a repeating theme. What happens when cultures you know, collide with each other and accommodate and conflict. And I see that downstairs. I see that in some of the um, choices that have been made. And I especially see it as then you translate that into a museum setting, you know, and you need to represent different cultures. It's you know, supposed to be a universal museum showing the different cultures, but really they're side by side. And is that disturbing? Is that process of selection, picking out um, an object, uh, and removing it from the functional <coughs> world of real things, the material world, and that process of collection moves it off into the, from the visible world into the invisible world. The invisible world is the world of spirit and of memories and of ideas. And as soon as you collect it and put it somewhere, it's something else altogether. So that is something I thought when I was downstairs as well. Yeah, I should say one of the reasons we asked Claire come speak was because um, I had read a book of hers about oh. ruins and, and fragments. And while Harris and I were working on the show, I mailed it to her yeah. <laughs> as like a, wow. we were exchanging kind of written material back and forth. And so um, later on when Michelle, who runs the lecture <laughs> series, was like, we want to invite someone to do another look, I was like, this is a perfect lens. <laughs> <laughs> I'm amazed that you found it because this, this particular exhibition was for the opening of the big Getty Center, the big modern building that some of you have visited. That was in 1997, many different events, and we had an exhibition on ruins. It was called Irresistible Decay. I'll never forget the look of our <laughs> exhibition manager that we were going to speak. We were going to premiere a show at the opening of the Getty on Irresistible Decay. But it's because our context is one, not only collections of objects, but a really vast library and archival image collection, photographs, original drawings, all of that paraphernalia, that apparatus of our, our historical research is there. So to bring those kinds of objects on paper, objects in the round, all together in this theme, which is ancient but also extremely modern, um, was an interesting challenge. And um, I, I really loved it. <laughs> the <laughs> critics <laughs> called it an oddball exhibition. Yeah. That's a, I think that's a good thing. <laughs> so. I'm curious, uh, you brought up Damien Hirst's new exhibition, and there's been a lot of controversy about the mask that he appropriated, and just what your take on that was. I have to tell you, I saw only um, some press images. I didn't see it. You've seen it. And of the press images, you know, some are classical, some are from another world. And then I saw the Aztec, you know, um, emblem of the sun, and then I was, you know, utterly perplexed. Um, <laughs> and, and so I'm curious to see. I won't judge, um, but uh, I'm curious to see the reception because it seems like a real distinct step from his earlier work. So it's an example. I tried to show things that are now, um, but I'll have to tell you my, my true favorite is the um, lion attacking a horse. That sculpture was with us um, for nine months, and it was the first time it had ever left Rome. And it's, um, you know, it's really big. It's as big as from here to the windows. It's a massive, very imposing sculpture and um, very important. So I became extremely attached to it. And still working. My last lecture was on the lion attacking horse. So when Charlie Ray, you know, obviously saw it, he lives in Topanga. Um, so when he came, he, he saw it at the villa and he's seen it in Rome. So his exhibition has just opened with this take, with this um, mountain lion take. So I had collected all the echoes of that sculpture in history, and now I have a new one. Um, and I think it's really good. I, I, I like it quite a bit. So 
but as I said, um, this is really um, very, don't you think, really prevalent. A lot of people doing this kind of work, you know, in different ways. Um, yeah, so. I think the sort of excavation or this, like what you described as the archaeological turn seems to be very prevalent in contemporary practice. I'm curious in terms of the Getty, if you have that a lot, contemporary artists coming, wanting to use the collection or using it as kind of a site of inspiration and research for their contemporary work and yes. whether the Getty has thought about um, having contemporary artists in residence or showing mm. those works alongside. Yeah, well, um, artists do come. I consider, you know, we all consider them one of the most important audiences um, and if they want to see something or work with something even in storage they're perfectly in the galleries you know almost whatever they want to do is good almost um, but if there's something that needs to be available in storage we'll make that happen um, and so there have been um, if you can think of the Venus figure of Jeff Koons that's ours <laughs> and people will come. We have done an exhibitions the only once in the past, recent past, um, of, um, of Jim Dine, who is pretty, you know, is pretty apparent. He's been interested in, you know, working with ancient themes, and he designed an installation, and that was interesting. Um, and uh, we haven't done it since. But we are planning, in when this new reinstallation of the Antiquities opens, which may be in about 15 months, the special exhibition will be a contemporary exhibition, which is maybe surprising. But um, it will be a uh, guest-curated, multiple artist um, installation, primarily of sculptures. And I understand that Platonism is going to be a a theme that under underlies them, but more than that, I'm, I think it's too early to tell you who or what. But I think it's a good thing. Um, I think it's a good thing. I think it'll bring. It always brings in um, a different audience. It brings in a younger audience, and it'll be a very sharp contrast to the you know um, extremely beautiful, um, refined, you know, our wonderful objects in beautiful settings. Um, but this will shake it up a little bit. So. Yeah, I'm excited about it. <laughs> so, should we go downstairs? Can you stay? You want to just walk around and you know look at a few things? Show? Yeah, that would be nice. Thanks again. <laughs>